All right, welcome. Um, so in the pre preparing this session, I wasn't quite sure what to actually talk about. Um, so there were a lot of proposals that were grouped in this topic area that are all very specific to specific APIs, and I think most of them have found a home in breakout sessions already. Things like feedback sessions about what do you want to get out of the search API. And um, so I don't think we um, need to talk about those here. Um, and instead, I would propose to talk about the high-level picture and direction of where we are going with APIs. Um, I'm open to suggestions, though. I don't have a lot of material myself to present. So if you have specific things you would like to talk about, please speak up. Um, so let me give you two slides of introduction for the high-level questions that I think would be interesting to discuss. Um, and then we can launch into the discussion. So this is a short overview, as I see it, uh, of where we are. Um, so we have a lot of new functionality that is being built on APIs. The request volumes are going up, and um, latency is, is important because a lot of um, latency-sensitive services depend on these APIs. Um, there's apps, there's increasingly the web using APIs, and there's a lot of third-party consumers as well, um, which we want to encourage to use these APIs because we want them to build on top of all the content that we have. Um, so we need to support this growing volume and uh, ideally do it at low latency and um, need to figure out how. The two main APIs that we have right now are the Action API, which is um, the traditional and uh, API and serves most requests. Um, it's very powerful. Started out as an edit uh, interface and has a lot of additional functionality uh, on top of that. And the fairly new REST API, uh, which doesn't have that much functionality um, and is mostly focused on content access at this point. And now we also have some smaller per service API like Oris um, that are standalone. That is basically one API per service um, and are not tied into one <coughs> overarching uh, API. And there's some differences between the main APIs uh, with regard to caching in particular. Um, the action API is mostly based on query parameters uh, that aren't necessarily ordered the same way, so it's very difficult to cache and purge. So as a result, there's mostly no caching in API responses. It's very much an RPC model. And on the other hand, REST is uh, deterministic URLs normally, so the default is caching, varnish caching, um, which helps with latency and scaling. Um, documentation and testing, that's orthogonal to those, but they're, they're two different choices that we have right now in implementations. One is using Swagger, specs um, versus uh, a custom documentation system that uh, has additional features that Swagger does not have, like um, localization. Um, and there's some implementation differences. Um, pair request CPU overheads differ quite a lot. Um, they are not necessarily inherent in the platforms that are used, but um, there are a lot of factors that play into that. But they are quite significant. If you look at it, like 35 milliseconds versus roughly half a millisecond per request, that's not nothing. Um, yeah, that's a slight difference in the processing model. There's a work over per request by default versus asynchronous event loops, which is relevant for proxy use cases, especially. So here are some of the big high-level questions that I think we could tackle in this session. Um, the first is. REST versus RPC, which direction are we moving in? Um, are we longer term moving to, to a REST model so that we can cache most responses? Um, are we, what kind of versioning do we use for the API? Um, there's currently two different approaches. In the Action API, there's a format parameter uh, where you can select the format, especially the JSON format. Um, to use or to return. While in the REST API, there's uh, several parts. There's a major version in the path. Then there's each endpoint has a stability marker. Um, endpoints start out as experimental often and then gradually move towards stable. 
and the promises that a stable endpoint, if it has changed in a breaking way, the major version has to be incremented. So you can basically rely on um, a stable endpoint keeping working. And there's content type headers with uh, spec versions in them. So you can find out uh, what exactly, if there's no non-breaking minor changes in the content that is returned, you can find that out with the content type. Um, and finally, well, not finally, but uh, the number of APIs, that is the discussion we had uh, several times now. Um, basically, new services like Aorus um, can expose a, a separate API. We can uh, keep doing that for each new service. And the, the other extreme would be to have one unified API that binds them all together and has one way to discover all this functionality and has a unified uh, monitoring and all these things. Um, or something in between where we find some compromise. And finally, if we manage to establish agreement on where we're moving, um, how do we get there? While they are in small steps uh, towards those, those things without obviously rewriting everything from scratch. So these are my proposals. Should maybe switch to the Etherpad. Go ahead. So I think that one API is probably not a very good solution. The, the REST API is really good at giving you information about one thing, one page or one image or one whatever it is. Whereas the Action API is optimized for giving you a piece of information about many pages. Um, if you have an arbitrary set of 500 pages, it's really hard to query that in a REST API and have it be done in any sane way and it would probably blow up your caching. Whereas that's exactly the use case that a lot of our bots and user scripts on wikis tend to have. So I think that we can pretty easily have both APIs that serve these different use cases. No. There's definitely different trade-offs between batching, um, which provides, with generators especially, providing very rich functionality where you can generate one list and then apply an operation in one go, one request. And on the other hand, the REST model is you do a lot of very small but cheap requests. So it basically puts the burden on the client to do a lot of this iterative work. Actually, the, I know the mobile apps want to do very few requests. And so some of the stuff they're looking at is making a REST API that gives them all of the information about one page that they need to do, like, their whole page display. Yeah, yeah, it's just a composition of other requests uh, again. That, that's a, a, good, a good use case for a REST API because you're accessing the information about one thing and you want it heavily cached. That yeah. wouldn't fit all that well in the, um, the action API unless we look into something like varnish X keys or something that we could have an endpoint that actually was easily purgeable. Um, there's even in the REST API, there's also post endpoints that let you do things that are not cacheable at all, like converting your custom wiki text to HTML or your custom HTML, modified HTML to wiki text. Uh, so it's not completely mutually exclusive in a way. It's it's REST too. It's it's a post endpoint. But um, I guess what we are most what I'm mostly interested in is should the most of the content, all the high traffic entry points that people hit all the time for standard tasks, should those ideally be cacheable? No, it depends or, on what the people are doing. Yeah, right. For it's basically about can we push it to all those that where that is a suitable pattern, because I think, and by volume, all the high volume ones are fairly straightforward, give me this information. While the more complex interaction patterns, those, those are bots, I mean, they also have high volume, but I think that that volume is not going to necessarily go that far up, 
Yeah, some bots really do hit a lot of requests, but they do things that wouldn't really benefit from caching, so caching isn't such a concern. I, I don't know that high volume is such a, a useful thing as to whether, just whether it's so performance sensitive and that it makes the same requests over and over again where caching is important or not. Yeah, it depends on what you build on top of it. If you if your main web front end is hitting this API, then caching is pretty important. Yeah. I'm Brian. Um, I think you guys actually mostly covered the things that came up here to say. Um, I, I I do think that the the REST versus RPC question is. Um, maybe a, a false dichotomy that there are um, there are many and varied and complex use cases for programmatic access to the, the content held inside MediaWiki um, and things that are more um, content export oriented typically align with with a REST API pattern with something where there's a noun that you're asking for things about the noun. Um, rest is typically, tell me about this dog, tell me about this cat, tell me about this pig sort of based. Um, and the action API is a bit more, um, it's not the most beautifully designed API that anybody's ever had in the world, but it's, it's, it's much more a um, kind of a cursor oriented, like give me I want to know this aspect about a varied set of content, and I probably don't know exactly which content I want, but I have some kind of search or discovery mechanism, some sort of query that I'm going to present to you that says, come back and tell me about all the things that happened related to these things. So um, I, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is that there are there are good uses for both patterns, um, and it really depends on the the particular consumer that's trying to be to um, satisfied which which type is built. Yeah, I guess the, as I said earlier, the question is more if we for endpoints that are more of the type, tell me about the cat or the dog, should we use REST for those, or should we use something that cannot be cached for everything? Yeah. That yeah, is, and I, I guess more the trade-off that we. That I, we I think you're going to have a hard time finding anybody who says that more caching would be bad as long as we can find reasonably performant ways to invalidate said caches, right? Okay. The one one of the three hardest problems in the history of the planet. One thing I'd like to be clear about is when you say REST versus RPC, are you referring to the RESTful APIs versus? RPC APIs, or are you talking about specifically the action APIs paradigm versus the, the um, Mostly restful. talking about basically everything being a post or some similarly opaque and diff difficult to, to cache request, where you can't hook into a standard HTTP cache semantics, but have to do, maybe still get to do some caching at the application layer further down, but it's a lot more complex. I think I think you 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 can I think the if you look at the action API's surface area it feels much more high level than the the restful API but you could implement that on top of the restful API so you could have essentially um, a, a client library for the restful API that looks and feels almost verbatim as the action API does and that would essentially give you both options with a single carrier mechanism Yeah, I agree, especially this where we move more work to the client. If you provide that code out of the box in a toolkit, then where you iterate over things. And there's already toolkits like um, Py, Wikibot, and so on that do some of this iterative stuff. Uh, then yeah, I agree, then you can get a similar feel in the end. Well, you could get a similar feel, but I think that you would run into more performance problems trying to emulate all the things that the Action API does using our REST API. Yeah, I agree, there's which, definitely cases. It, it, which goes back to the point that both APIs are good, and I don't think that we need to try to say we only need one. 
Yeah. Um, okay, but I think that they serve different purposes, for sure. I mean, the two APIs that we have right now, they serve different purposes and they're both very legit. Honestly, when I had to do very simple interactions with uh, MediaWiki and the, the action API seemed like an overkill in some cases and mostly, I, I mean, I never took a look at it and some things looked like counterintuitive for the casual user that I was. So I think that for a casual user, so somebody that just wants to build something on top of our data, the RESTful API could be much better if you want to do some quick prototyping. And that's what RESTful is good for, right? It's simple. It's, there are some things anyways that REST, because it's built on top of HTTP properly, uh, cannot do. For example, it's supposed to be stateless, meaning that you can just, you can properly uh, keep state between requests. So one of the things that historically people implementing just REST APIs have problem with is transactions. Uh, I, I'm not sure that we do transactions uh, right now in the uh, Action API, but we could, in theory, just allow people to do transactions with their requests. Where well, it's, uh, let's say, philosophically wrong with a REST API to do transactions. Uh, I think that for um, we are now moving a lot to use REST API in general between our internal services. And that's going to present some limitations on the long run, maybe. I, I mean, uh, I've seen uh, quite a few projects moving away from REST for their public interface. I mean, some data stores that are trying to use, for example, gRPC, which is a, a, a new standard of RPC um, interactions that Google published as open source, uh, which is basically implementing on top of HTTP2 a lot of things that it's kind of hard to do with REST usually. So uh, making promises and timeouts and managing timeouts explicitly from the client side and the server side, which is one of the problems that we, are, we, we were thinking of tackling, right, Gabriel, if you think. Uh, I think it was a, a ticket written by you about this exactly. So uh, I think for the public, the REST API is important for people that just want to consume data quickly from uh, MediaWiki or that want just to build, I don't know, s simple clients, uh, especially for reading, I think it's great. Um, I think that probably the Action API has a big value for people doing more complex things that need more rich interactions directly and those people are typically, I, I'm not worried about caching for people doing complex things because complex things are going to be hard to cache or maybe even um, let's say, painful to cache because they, I, I mean, I don't expect many people to ask for the same set of 500 articles at the same time, right? So it's probably going to be more harmful than good to cache those. And that's why the REST API that goes just by entity, by single entity, is easier to cache and that makes sense in that case. But uh, even, I, I would say that Okay, this is about how we interact with the public right now. So as people outside of, uh, of the media, Wikimedia cluster interact with our content. And I agree that we need to, to keep both APIs. I would like us to think about a little bit if we want to keep moving with, with REST interfaces for everything within our cluster, so within with various services. I think we should consider going on if that fulfills all of our needs completely, or if we have to think of moving, uh, let's say, to an evolution of REST in some ways internally. And that's a part of the problem. I mean, uh, probably for simple things like, I don't know, Mathoid, uh, which d does just one simple thing, REST is good enough. But if we start to move more things outside of the uh, main blob of MediaWiki, like uh, bigger things, or let's make an exa a stupid example, right? Uh, image conversion. You might want to do, uh, to have MediaWiki call an external service to do an image conversion or transformation, and you want to come back later to get to fetch results, and you want to have, to be able to define uh, in a clear way what happens when a request time, times out or it is not fulfilled in, in the time that you want to serve a result to the, to the client. In most cases, probably, if we keep rest, it's going to be uh, a limitation in the long run. So 
Okay. I think there's there's lots of solutions out there. Um, large companies having often their own frameworks. Um, Google has their. Um, some are using REST actually. Some are using various uh, frameworks, but. It's a big step. I think that's the main issue with moving to a different framework internally. Um, it has a high cost as well, so there have to be compelling advantages. Um, but yeah, I, I agree REST is not the most efficient or uh, technically best thing ever. It's just ubiquitous and yeah, easy to understand for anybody. Um, I'm so one of the things I'd like to suggest is that we, I mean, we can keep going on the REST conversation, REST RPC conversation. Um, one thing that I would like to do as well is, is A, just provide a reminder on what this, this area as a whole is meant to be, is about basically getting, getting access to our content, getting uh, data in and out of the system. Um, regardless of what format it's in, we've got the content format area to talk about that. This area is about the infrastructure around the content and um, how, and the APIs are central to that. Um, so I wanted to provide that reminder there. And then um, uh, as a follow-up to that, I would like to, to ask, there was a session earlier um, that Dan and Andrew um, were were, were uh, leading, um, but there was a lot of people in that session. Um, could one of you, would you, one of you mind, I'll put you on the spot here, wouldn't you mind just giving like a, a 60 second overview of what you all discussed in that? And Sure, so we generally talked about um, this general concept of data flows, collecting, uh, processing and serving data and how it relates to um, like how that is done by different teams, search, fundraising, uh, research, analytics, and different requirements uh, from, from all of those different perspectives and uh, efforts on event bus and kind of trying to Mostly the consensus was that pretty much everyone thought the problem was similar enough that we wanted to work on it together and similar enough that event bus could solve uh, all the different use cases um, and that, but that we needed to collaborate and, and, and start working on it together. So um, do I need to clarify any of that for anyone? Because I used words that, you know, <laughs> like I don't know if everyone knows event bus or things like that. Raise hands. I don't know. Okay. It's a REST API for Kafka, essentially. Right. Is that, it's actually maybe maybe just a further clarification on Event Bus because I know that, that. Okay. So I'll, I'll, I'll yeah. So I'm 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 just asking for a further clarification on Event Bus because I know that we've had at least some mailing dis list discussion in the past about what is Event Bus and how relevant it is it is it to this area and so uh, yeah I think maybe. Um, just a little bit more. Sure. So uh, the general idea is that you want to structure all the data that's flowing in the similar uh, similar paradigm so that everyone can understand uh, what to do as a consumer, what to do as someone who's interested in different streams that you want to join different streams or whatever. So the, the main idea is like all, all these data pieces that are flowing through the system should have a schema so that consumers can understand them so that we can go back in time like two, three years and be able to consume data that ha that was produced then that, uh, you know, we might not remember what the code looked like. So factoring out this this metadata in, term, in the form of a schema is one of the primary things. And then from that point, really, Event Bus is just uh, making it easy to produce events in, in those schemas to a stream and not so much worried about the consumption part because that can get tricky, but, but just kind of generally um, having the streams there so people can join them or do whatever they need with, with them and, and sort of standardize how, how all of that works. And one example that might be interesting is um, uh, the search team wants to integrate things like 
uh, page rank or page view statistics in how they rank uh, results. And so having a stream of, of that kind of data is useful for them. Um, and knowing the structure of that data is, you know, accomplished by the schema. That's an exa a concrete example. Any other session summaries? So I would um, propose to, uh, I was curious about the um, number of APIs. We talked about two APIs having good reasons, um, but we have recently created a couple of new services and there are separate APIs for those. Um, what is your take on that? What is the, I mean the trade-offs are possibly user friendliness and discoverability versus um, independence of how the APIs are designed. So now, oh, there it is. Um, I wanted to reply on uh, some of the earlier comments. Uh, so uh, one thing that was brought up is uh, being able to do batch requests in the Action API. Um, it's, a, it's a very important use case for a lot of uh, bots and tools that need data. Um, but well, what one thing that does maybe reduce the need for that a little bit, and I'm not sure to, to what extent we can expect this to be ubiquitous in tools, but um, HTTP2 and Speedy by extent do allow for a lot more easily to have parallel requests or in, in other ways to batch more data. And the, the other thing is what we're seeing now in REST space as well is that it can compose data objects without needing to fetch them again, right? Uh, just because you make a batch request to rest base doesn't need doesn't mean rest base needs to do a batch request at the back end it can fetch the individual object that it already has and, and use them um, but it does bring up like in what way we want to do caching so right now if I understand correctly we don't really utilize a varnish uh, for for rest based caching I don't know if it completely biomasses it but at least it, it's not like the main purpose uh, to be cached there because we want to cache it in Cassandra instead if I understand correctly. No, it's mostly relying on varnish. Uh, there's some issues still with logged in requests but that's a general, that's some, a, a task to fix right. that. But it's, okay. uh, all the high traffic stuff is basically relies on varnish. Okay, that's interesting. Um, and so yeah, so what I wanted to bring up is basically using rest base as a composer versus rest base as a proxy. So there's various services that we now bundle into one process uh, that run essentially as one HP service, um, but there's also services that Westbase includes but also doesn't include in that they are exposed there but actually run as a separate process or as a separate service entirely but are proxied through it. So they're still exposed through it and I think that's an interesting model that we can explore more. But it does bring up uh, like where, what we want to do with storage. Like do we want the individual storage to be the individual service to do the storage or do we want Cassandra behind Westbase to do the storage for like long term things. So like separating those concerns. Um, so, interesting. Yeah, I guess it's a little off topic for the API part only, but um, it's definitely important for the system design. I think one, it's a lot simpler to, to scale and manage stateless services, so there's a strong incentive to keep state out of services. Um, some of that was the idea with, with rest base originally. I think there are limits to that. Um, we can't, shouldn't use one storage layer for everything and there should definitely shouldn't be access, direct access from one service to the other service's storage uh, so it can change things behind its back. There should be clear ownership. Yeah. Um, and I think right now we, most of the use cases that REST base serves are um, basically cache-like use cases. In some cases, it's authoritative because it's uh, bound to a user session, for example. And we can consider using it for actual storage of actual content, authoritative content in the future, but that's not what's used right now. Um, yeah, but there's also NQS, for example, the um, analytics query service has its own Cassandra cluster, its own storage. Which one, sir? The analytics query service yeah. for page view data has its own Cassandra cluster and uh, they write to it from uh, Hadoop and uh, are independent in, in their management and that has worked pretty well. So, it, so it only proxies for Rust, but it doesn't store it inside Rust Space's Cassandra cluster? Yes, yes. Okay. So yeah, there, there's kind of this dual role of aggregating APIs and presenting one unified API to the outside. 
uh, that Red Rest base currently fills, but that can also be implemented for really high traffic endpoints in something like Varnish, like we can tee off this traffic to directly to the back end without it ever reaching Rest base. But it's more about the, what model do we want to expose to the developer in terms of documentation. Should it be one path in one general API, or is it a separate domain, for example, or completely separate branch for a different API? I just wanted to make a quick point. One of the things I liked about, so we worked on the analytics query service, and one of the things I liked about that experience was uh, the modularity between the storage and the API level. I think that's really, really important. We did run into problems with Cassandra, both computing data to, to stick into it because it needs everything pre-computed and serving data out of it while it's being loaded and, and lots of things like that. We solved some of it. We're still working on some of it. But we love the flexibility that we can just say it's easy from rest based to implement like a Druid module or a pipeline DB module and query that instead. And I think whatever, whatever um, kind of APIs and, and things we develop, we should always think about that modularity because you never really know until you, you hit, you know, scaling issues or query issues or whatever. Yeah. Um, I have a question regarding performance. Um, so did you, did you benchmark reading from um, the REST-based API via reading directly from Hadoop? Um, so, I mean, that could be comparable in theory, but would be interesting to see how those compare. Um, Dan, that is, seems to be analytics specific. I did not benchmark Hadoop. No, uh, no, you don't really want to query Hadoop. Um, we don't, so we didn't even try. Um, like, it's not a system that you want to be responsible for keeping online with a level of reliability that an API would need. And yeah, latency. So there's, there, yeah, there's no real, I mean, it's got to like start up the VM and like do all this stuff every time you ask it anything, so. Also, we only have one Hadoop cluster, that's important too, yeah, but. Um, yeah, I think uh, a separate storage layer, a separate presentation layer for the data makes sense from a lot of different points of view, both data model and I mean there's like databases very specialized for time series, for graph, for whatever that you definitely want to use. You don't want to just go against Hadoop. Just a comment on just API design, and one thing I've noticed that's different between uh, the REST-based approach and the MediaWiki Action API approach, and just in terms of having more granularity in the endpoints and more restrictions on what you can request individually allows you to have more robust documentation on like the response type, so you actually have a schema that you can say is guaranteed for a specific version of an endpoint, um, which is kind of orthogonal to REST versus Action, but the Action API um, in its flexibility and allowing you to compose different data objects in the same response makes it exponentially more difficult to say, like, this query that you just made up has this schema and has these properties that are guaranteed, whereas REST-based can say very explicitly, this is what you're going to get, this, pro this field is optional, this field is an integer, and things like that, and the ability to granularly, discreetly change that schema over time and enforce backwards compatibility it's nice that Rest Space has considered that more important from the get-go. And it's not, I'm not saying that's something that we couldn't explore in the Action API thing. It's just one thing that, in my experience, is nicer to work with as a developer. Still no comments on the number of APIs? I was on a walk talking about APIs uh, before I walked in the room. So, like, could you maybe kind of restate that question? Um, so, we have a lot of new services, and some of them have started to expose their own API, like Auris, right now. And um, we could follow that model of um, each new service having potentially their own API 
different domain or a different sub branch under slash API slash service name. And um, at the other extreme would be having one API that assembles them all, has one unified form to document it, and, uh, and then there's obviously the current state, which is somewhere in between, where we have two APIs. So I'm mostly wondering about the, should we push or nudge services to integrate into one larger API, or two larger APIs, or should we um, let, encourage separate APIs, basically? Oh, okay. So when you say one API, you mean um, one domain that has a bunch of specific endpoints underneath it that are like well described. Mm -hmm. Yeah, something where you have a. Um, Unified documentation, so you can discover what is available. You can browse it, and um, of course, this could also be built on top of multiple separate APIs. But um, I guess the question is how uniform those would be. So, those are the trade-offs that I see. But um, you want to weigh in? Um, well, I, I so I, I have a sort of a different question, but I'll, I'll you know I'll 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 save, I'll save my question for a second. Yeah, um, just to speak on the kind of multiple APIs, I know one of the things we ran into, especially when I first joined and even you know, up to now, is just to. Oh, Corey, and I'm on um, the mobile apps team. Okay. Uh, but yeah, the discoverability of the APIs, like what's, uh, there's so many people have worked on so many things and they're so disparate and, like you said, multiple domains, like discoverability really is a problem. I'm. I can't think of how many times like we've come across like, oh, we really need an API that does this only to like mention it in passing and, and like in a, something like this. It's like, oh, that's already been like three times and here's where you find it. So I think, you know, whether it's actually one URL or how it works, but the discoverability I think is really important. I think some sort of source documentation and, you know, however we do that, I think that's kind of like, this is a level up from this, but I think that's kind of important. Boom. Okay. Uh, this is working. Yeah, so I don't think that there's like a perfect answer right now. I mean, the API.php documentation um, is usually not bad. Um, in most cases, people who are like uh, creating an API.php implementation could document their interfaces better. Um, yeah, we don't right now like have the ability to easily state what the output looks like, although I'm sure that would be possible. But yeah, I'd, like generally I'd be in, in favor of having um, most of the high performance internet facing APIs like more centrally available for discoverability purposes and for developers to be able to see things um, and allow API.php to change faster um, it's easy like for people who are building uh, front-end code for the Wikimedia properties, for example, to adjust their stuff for API.php on the fly, but for people who have packaged implementations or um, like suppose they're third party and they need to have like a highly reliable interface, um, having like a central place of documentation would be, would be better. So I, I don't think like there's a simple answer myself. Well, speaking about the ORIS in particular, I just wonder if some of the the reason behind them having their own API was because they implemented it in labs, and you can't have a production service depending on labs. And once they move it into production, then they're I hear that they're looking at integrating in both REST base and the Action API. Uh, speaking of ORIS, I think that. It's Basically, because it's written, it's a completely different project. So it has its own API, of course, and you can probably integrate it into RESTBase or any global API endpoint that you want. But I, I, I want to say, okay, I can I can hear you, Marco. Sorry. Okay. Okay. 
Uh, anyways, I think that there are good reasons for having both uh, a unified API for most things. I mean, at least the, mo the things that more people would, would, would like to use for building clients for our rich data set, right? And for having single purpose specified API for the single service because that's of course going to be uh, more flexible and can have a different format than it shouldn't conf necessarily conform to the standard that you uh, should conform to if you want to have a unified API. What we need and what we don't have, that's what uh, Corey said before, is we don't have a good uh, site for documentation, a, good, a unified documentation of all uh, of our APIs. It's not. I mean, when I try to search for information, I have to go around searching for information, and we should probably spend some time and maybe even have somebody do that. that for, uh, the microphone. Oh, okay, it's <laughs> came back. We should probably have somebody doing that work. Uh, explicitly, I mean, documenting all the APIs that we expose to the public, uh, because it's it's a lot of things. I mean, even the Wiki, Wiki Data Query service is an API, if you want, right? So we should really have a, a, a single place where a developer can go and just look around at all the APIs that we offer, and have a an unified API for most things, which has a standard structure that's unified for everything, logic in itself. Hi, uh, I'm Steven. I'm on the mobile apps team as well. Um, I wanted to make sure that I understood the question. So would another example of multiple APIs be the differences between uh, querying content on, or sorry, uh, retrieving content on Wikipedia versus Wiktionary? Uh, no, those are I would consider those different sites, and you can have the same uh, API structure for both of them. Um, so whether that is part of the a parameter or whether that's just a different domain and exposes the slash, same slash API, whatever path, or api.php, um, I would consider that the same. But um, the question is more different bits of functionality for Wiktionary, for example. The query part, should that be a separate ser service and a separate API? Uh, with a different structure potentially, or should we try to unify at least the ones that are generally useful into one coherent API, or at least gradually nudge things in, in that direction? So it, it's, it's kind of like uh, how great it is that you can do a query on Wikipedia and then run a similar query on Commons, is that right? Using yeah. MediaWiki API. Yeah, at least for all the features that are common between the two, which is a lot. I, so. I think from the perspective of a developer that is really focused on solving a particular problem, it's absolutely wonderful to have an API that is in the same terminology of the particular site. So for example, if I'm on Wiktionary and I say define the word dog, I probably have a, a pretty good idea of what that is just by looking at the endpoint. How neat is that? Um, can you give an example for how this would, would differ between Wikipedia and Wiktionary? Um, perhaps for Wikipedia, the example is article. The endpoint is article. Mm. And I say, give me the article for dog and that gives me the full content of an article, or give me the link, the, give me the card for dog, and that gives me like a small amount of data that I can present in a card-like interface. And some of these, I think, would be common, but uh, having, having different APIs or allowing different APIs would make it much easier, I think, for developers focused on a specific problem for a specific, uh, installation of a specific site. But to clarify, you mean slightly different functionality, so you get a different response. For example, on Wiktionary, you would get a definition that has, as we were actually just discussing, a summary, while, while on other sites, maybe you would use a summary that has a lead paragraph and a page image. Um, 
Yeah, I, I uh, personally, I, I don't really think of developing a really generic app that just works with every single media wiki install. Um, I, I think it could be done, but as a developer, I'm like, I'm really interested in uh, focusing on the content or the data at one site and developing an app for that. Yes, definitely, I agree that whenever there's different needs and different functionality, it should be named differently. There's no point in confusing people by naming the same and actually doing something different. But um, there's also cross-cutting functionality, like just give me the HTML for this page as it is rendered. That can probably be named the same if it's doing the same thing. I'm the gatekeeper, so go ahead. So I think generally, um, but but I would recommend is separating the the because I completely agree with Stephen. I think you have an API surface area, which is you know the the actual things that you call the functions you call, and they're different in action and REST based, and and you know there could be specific ones for um, like ORES and things like that. But separating that from the actual um, like a transport mechanism, client side libraries. What we do is we have uh, gRPC that's used internally for absolutely everything. And then we have protocol buffers that define specific APIs for specific things. So if a mobile application needs to talk to its back end, it can communicate directly via that mechanism and using a predefined um, protocol buffer. So essentially, the only thing that's different between specific API is uh, APIs are the, the the actual service area, which is the protocol buffer, and the, the code that implements it. But everything else is standardized, and that makes discovery easier. It makes implementation easier. You don't have to think about is this RESTful, is this that, which client library do I use, where do I go to look for this thing. Um, that's all standardized, and it makes it much simpler. And it also allows you, by virtue of being centralized, to enhance, to add things like HTTP2 caching and, and, and stream reuse and things like that that grossly simplify the, the effort to build a new API and, and to use an, an, an existing API from a new front end. Yeah, I think the API spec work is actually also moving in that space. It might not be quite there, and there might uh, definitely pros and cons. But I think the point in time where that was making your own was the only way to get all these benefits. I think it has changed a lot since then with HTTP2 and um, with specs that have been developed since. So I think REST is no longer the, so cold as it used to be, the cold world out there. I okay, just want to remind everyone that we have less than half an hour left, so uh, refocusing uh, our efforts on what we want to achieve is good, but I also want to bring up two points. Um, one is, uh, so regarding the merging of services uh, behind REST base, I think it also brings up an interesting point with uh, regards to focus of scalability and uptime. Um, so like, I think it will be a pretty big difference for something like ORIS, whether it is behind uh, REST base or not, in terms of how many instances you need of that service and how uh, exposed it is, and it goes in both ways. Right? And on the one hand, if REST base is highly reliable and highly uh, available, it would cover a more short outage in ORIS. But the other way around, if ORIS were to expose directly, it wouldn't be affected by downtime in REST base. So th those two also uh, are playing some. Like, can you still serve content when one is down? Um, this would, of course, be simplified when you have something like Varnish, which also covers those kinds of gaps. Um, but I just want to bring that up. Yeah, also fault isolation, having one cluster versus multiple clusters so that you can avoid one deploy wiping it all out and the procedures around deploys all play into it. So, yeah, uh, Just a comment since this is my area, area basically. Uh, that's exactly the problem that I posed about having a proxy in front of everything. We already have varnish for good reasons. Having multiple proxies, it may be good for functionality, so for uh, presenting a unified API, but it's surely not a good thing for stability. There's no way it's a good thing for stability. I mean, there's no way. The, it, it, the good thing is that a path-based structure makes it fairly easy to rewrite or map specific requests to specific backends and something like Varnish. But the downside is that you get more complexity in the Varnish configuration, basically. So you want to keep the number of entry points. I know that Brandon has been doing work on uh, making that more streamlined, registering basically path prefix and mapping it to a backend. Um, that would help basically, we could still expose it as one documentation, but 
have the request go straight to the backend without ever touching REST space. So I think that could give us the best of both worlds. It looks the same to the outside, but it actually goes straight there. But that's I think a, that's, that's a long tail of low requests, low, non -very, not very critical endpoints where it might be okay to just go through REST space. Yeah. Uh, so uh, also mentioned earlier was uh, having a shared place for documentation on different APIs. And, uh, and indeed, S has been working on this on MediaWiki.org and myself as well on uh, Wikitech. Uh, but um, a more significant effort on that is also um, the developing hub that uh, some people are working on, which is somewhat comparable to like what you would, for example, see with developer.google.com, where you have a shared interface of all the different products that we have and the APIs that they expose. So that is uh, definitely in, in the work, although it's not what I'm personally working on. Um, my second point was this, uh, when you have a unified interface, you also have unified versioning. Um, so it gets a little bit more tricky in how you deal with major breaking changes when everything is under one API. You also have one API version number, at least the way it's currently structured. Uh, that can also be something we, uh, that, that, that can really quickly um, expand complexity in how different people uh, have the authority within the API. Like if, because if everybody's in the same API, then who actually owns the version number? And like, how many times do you want to keep breaking things and rewriting things? And then you get a lot more cache fragmentation for things that didn't change and stuff like that. Yeah, it's related to the discussion about pair entry point versioning versus uh, global API versions. Um, you, can, you can have both, but um, that gives you the flexibility to, to keep both up and working. But, um, yeah, one paths are one option, while uh, other parameters could be another option. So that's a lot of. You generally, you can push as as we've experienced in the P action API. You can push backwards compatibility pretty far by being only additive, um, and still uh, supporting the old requests. Um, but yeah, there's always going to be breaking changes. We yeah we so far don't have. Uh, pair entry point versions, but we're considering using accept headers. But um, right now, as, as it is documented, the stable APIs would force a major version increment, which has the problem you, you bring up. Uh, something else um, I was thinking about when we're talking about the kind of usability of the APIs is that as developers, when we get started, it's pretty much important that we understand the relationship between the sites, and then some sites are more coupled to others uh, than others are. So obviously all the different language sites are for Wikipedia are extremely tightly coupled. And that kind of goes with commons as well, whereas some other pro like project like Wiktionary is a little further off to the side. So as a developer using the API, it's, it's kind of odd if I'm looking for Wikipedia content and then I have to get images and then I'm going over to the Commons API. So in a situation like that, it might make much more sense to have a unified API, whereas if we're talking about some other side project like Wiktionary or something like that, it does make more sense maybe if they are separate, but you know, it's kind of like something to think about where it might be more of like a case-by-case -case basis. But I mean, and this you know, it goes more than just beyond developers to like our perception from the public of like, we're basically seen as Wikipedia and we have all these other projects and it's, it's hard to understand how they all relate together. And I think the way we do our APIs also shows it's like also confusing to us and how they relate together. So I think when we think about restructuring our API, we should kind of think about that perception of how we want these things to be seen and how they should be seen to the outside world. We, there are some technical issues there, but I, I totally agree with your with your point. It's just that we currently don't have a mechanism in place to deduplicate all this at the caching layer, for example. So if you expose the same image through 800 APIs, 800 domains, then you have clearly have to deduplicate that. So one one API means like under one domain, or it just means because you're talking about like proxying between all the different services or something. So is that like one domain or does that mean, I'm, just, I'm still not really sure what that means, I guess. Yeah, there's two ways to look at it, I guess. One is the API structure, which would be the same for German Wikipedia versus English Wikipedia versus French Wikipedia. Right. But then there's, um, so that is one way to say this is one API, it's one structure, yeah. it's one spec, but it's exposed at three different or 200 different uh, domains. 
Um, or you could treat one domain as one API. And you're talking about routing based on path prefixes, but that would be for like different services that might be internal and exposing, instead of proxying through REST base or something. I'm talking about varnish routing. Basically. Oh, you can bypass, yeah. You can, based on path prefixes, you can bypass varnish, uh, REST base and tell varnish to go straight to the back end. Right. And the outside doesn't need to know. I mean, you just see it in URL and What's what's the yes, benefit of doing that over just using a different domain and routing it that way? Oh, domains are fairly expensive. If you um, if you are a client on English Wikipedia, you have a connection open to English Wikipedia. You have the domain DNS resolved to English Wikipedia. Um, so you better if you want to have a fast response, you better use English Wikipedia for your API as well. Uh, you want to minimize the number of uh, domains you use and the number of connections you have to open, especially with TLS. Um, that's several round trips per connection. And um, that's basically the limiting factor or the motivation for having these APIs at slash API something. Um, we have 15 minutes left. I'm the timekeeper. OK. <laughs> yeah, well, and, and that's one of the things I wanted to make sure we talked about, because this is about content access in APIs. And I wanted to make sure that we um, also, that we didn't just focus on the API as being the only way to get at the data. Um, uh, uh, um, Ariel ran a session earlier about um, the um, the getting at the dumps and like the and how we generate uh, dumps of our data. And uh, yeah. yeah, so just a summary. Um, uh, one of the main we ways that users get at our data is they download XML or SQL dumps of tables or revision and page content. And there are more and more data sets that are being produced over time as well. Uh, these dumps get slower and slower to run. Um, and at some point, the old architecture, organically grown, has gotten just very difficult to maintain. I hate dealing with it anymore. So the idea is if we knew what our users f saw as flaws or were missing, and we could toss the old system altogether and just solve it ideally, what would that look like? Um, use, reusing as much work as being done here as possible. Uh, so the event bus uh, was one of the things that came up repeatedly. One as a way of distributing jobs out to different nodes, uh, and another as a way that we could make incremental data available, because people beg us for incremental dumps. They want to have a full snapshot, and then they want to just see a feed of what's coming up, you know, in two days or five days, what's changed, instead of having to download and process this whole huge thing again. Um, so those were the two event bus um, uses. And, um, oh, already I'm forgetting. Um, help, is anyone here that was there? Because uh, my brain just went dead. I'm jet lagged. I promise it's not the speakers. Um, anyways, there were several other suggestions that were very helpful. Um, trying to think of maybe having pages with their revisions together in HDFS. And every page is a separate item. So regenerating a dump just looks like deleting old pages, putting new pages in, and then somehow packaging those up for download. And there's a number of different um, ideas. Um, you can find the Etherpad. Uh, please chime in. There'll be a project. Um, dumps rewrite, at least hopefully that'll be created. And uh, so I would encourage people to get on and, and help us make those better. There's also HTML dumps that are yes, yes. experimental. Yes, we talked about them. We talked about them. See, this is why brain dead. <laughs> um, we have multiple formats coming out from different sources. We want it to be easy. So instead of I have to write a whole different set of OK, how do these get generated and how often? And we index them and this and that. It should be one infrastructure that just, you say, uh, here's my source. Here's the script that runs it. Here's where they live. And then everything just happens. So the HTML dumps were absolutely a, a prime candidate there, a prime example. Yeah, those are currently using SQLite databases, so they can be updated uh, in place, basically, random access. But Downside is you have to download a full database. You can't stream it. So, Gabriel, I'd be appreciative if you could help tease out the question I'm about to ask. And it has to do um, maybe with a long-run um, vision of 
uh, both a universal translator and engaging um, perhaps Wiktionary in relation to Wikipedia, to Wikidata, um, if that was something, for example, that World University and School could further. How would this paradigm work in terms of maybe a unified, a generally unified API scenario that you were um, mentioning, if, as Daniel Kinsler said just a half hour ago, that Wiktionary is in the works for both text and uh, spoken uh, language in the future. Um, would it, the versatility of this API, I'm not a programmer, um, be able to be applied from Wiktionary, say, to um, content translation to uh, a from language and a to language in Wikipedia in a particular article. Is, uh, how, how to conceive of these various APIs within this unified API structure as one gains more significance, hypothetically, brainstorming-wise, um, is my question, I think. Um, I'm not sure if you're after word-to-word -word correspondence or if you're looking for text translations. What is the use case? Um, the, the use case might be to go from a Mandarin uh, Wikipedia article or a MIT open courseware course um, in, Wiki, in Wikidata, in Wikipedia, into uh, an English Wikipedia article from that Chinese or Mandarin or from um, uh, MIT open courseware um, into English. Uh, so for article translations, we have um, the content translation project, which is very nice, provides a nice user interface, and uses machine translation to support uh, the user. So you start out with the machine translation, you can fix it up. So that would be my suggestion for article. So all are, all are, are unique domain APIs in one sense. And is that my understanding from what the previous speaker right here just asked? Um, uh, to conceive of media trans uh, content translation as well as um, Wiktionary as well as uh, each Wikipedia language as separate APIs, um, or you consider you could consider could you consider all of Wikipedia one API vis-a-vis -vis all of Wiktionary one PA API one versus um, content translation as yet a third API? I'm trying to clarify in my own mind how APIs this sort of schema that uh, work. Togethers. Um, I'm not sure I, I understand the question completely. I think this content translation has a separate API right now. You're right, um, but your question is if they are can be integrated or what is yeah, more and more fully integrated in different ways. Um, yeah, we. I'm Scott McLeod. Well, they can be definitely when we are in conversation with um, the content translation team. So, okay. Um, but there's concerns around they're using third-party translation services, and we don't want to expose those to the world necessarily. Right. So, um, thank you. You have to consider those. Yeah. Just also like say like I also work on OpenStreetMap, and the way like they handle like like diffs and like dumps, and also like the APIs. Like I think. Well, maybe not perfect, but it's like like it works pretty well. Um, like the changes, like they're stored as like change sets, like in the database, and then they provide like like minutely, hourly, like um, daily, just different in incremental like dumps as well as like the whole thing. And then there's like tools that that like pretty easily you can slice and dice or like like, like apply like the changes to keep like your copy up to date. So like. There, I think there's a quite a prolifer proliferation of like third parties like well Mapbox now like us and like providing like services and like tools and and like as well like their API it's like a REST API which is like it's like version six but it's been around for like years and has been like stable and and so like I think that also helps like like people like build stuff around it and and just a lot to get like used pretty widely. Like, so it's, I mean, at least for Wikidata, like something like having like the structured diffs and like, like providing them incrementally, like I don't think would be like so hard to do, but like still needs like like some sort of infrastructure and and stuff. <laughs> 
yeah, mm-hmm. that's also, time to get that done, like some, someone to get that done. But yeah. There's also a lot of interaction between the APIs and the incremental updates, for example. If you just distribute to the list of changes, you might have a REST line just run these updates by hitting a REST API. So, like, in, in terms of domain names, like, how many distinct domain names we need, like, I, I guess for myself, I would probably prefer to see something like www.wikimedia.org slash API. Um, I know that we've, like, had the rest.wikimedia.org domain in the past, but um, getting that to be consistent uh, so that users, when they land on projects in the future, um, are operating off of one domain, um, might simplify certain things. It might help us become more aware of things like DNS poisoning. Um, it also would simplify things, I think, for developers in general. So I'd, I'd be kind of interested on that front. I do understand, like, right now, uh, mm-hmm. it's very much impractical uh, because of the nature of how skins are rendered uh, more or less on a per-domain basis or how experiences are rendered on a per-domain basis. Um, and there's certain assumptions. But, um, yeah, just that's kind of like... Um, where my thinking is that I, I think it'd be really neat if um, when somebody comes to read an HTML page in the browser, if it were served off of a singular domain, and that might be bootstrapping you know, some sort of API-backed experience, um, whether it's done you know, at server composition or if it's done via like, client orchestration. Um, yeah, uh, But I'm, I'm not sure how that works like, from an ops perspective, if we actually standardized on one domain name kind of across the board. I don't want to conflate uh, having the API endpoints with serving the HTML, but I think like ine- inevitably that's probably like the simpler approach. Yeah, we, we currently have um, upload, and um, we have www.mediawiki.org actually for some global data like AQS, yeah. uh, page view data is exposed there. But um, yeah, the main issue really is number of connections. If you are mainly on English yeah. Wikipedia and you also do some API requests, then um, you just need to open extra connections if it's a different domain. And that's on right. a slow connection, that's a second or so. Just your TLS set up, several round trips, maybe right. some packet loss thrown in. Right. That's very expensive. And With multiple domain names, right? So yeah, I mean, I, I heard you earlier on like standardizing for both like older user agent implementations, um, and ones that are even newer. Like, I think it's like generally that's good. I, I wasn't sure though, like, in terms of whether our kind of VIP architecture can handle um, like an arbitrarily large number of sockets uh, to the same domain name. Maybe that's a non issue in our environment. I don't, maybe somebody from Ops could speak to that. Like, suppose that we wanted to unify everything under one domain name um, with the projects yeah, being like path based underneath that, like both on the API and on the HTML website side? Or do you know? Yeah, I mean, people will still go to English Wikipedia, mm-hmm. probably, unless we can tell them it has to be www slash en, which would be a big change. Yeah, I, know, I, I realize this. Like, There's a <laughs> convoluted uh, step, a bunch of rewrites that happen right now. Um, and maybe that's just the way it will always be. I think. Um, Timo's proposal to have an entry point f- across projects that directs people to all these different um, resources that are available. I think that it seems to be a lot more practical in the short term, including you should use comments for images, this kind of information. That's, I think, yeah, that, I think the point that we have to treat this as, as an outsider, we don't actually know what these projects do. As an insider, we yeah, dictionary it seems obvious, but to the outside, not so much. Yeah, that, that, they don't need to necessarily reside on the same domain to be discoverable through one domain. Um, yeah. As you know, HTML can point to anything, and so that that, that can be really powerful. Um, in terms of reuse of, con- I think it, I think it makes sense to keep wiki-specific APIs uh, exposed under that wiki's domain. Um, if anything, to, to simplify connection reuse and just being able to contextually discover it when you're already on that particular project. Uh, so in wikipedia.org slash API you know, gives you what you would expect. But if you're a high traffic consumer that uh, consumes a lot of different Wikimedia projects uh, content, um, 
I think internally we will probably always be serving different projects as being one service, right? Like we don't have a Wikipedia server, we have a MediaWiki uh, um, app cluster and they're essentially presented as one service. And the same for REST-based, like REST-based takes the domain essentially as a parameter of a longer resource. It's not in any way more significant than the page title or the, re or the revision name really. Um, and so if you want everything for one domain, we can already do that. That's what rest base that we community.org is for, for. So for, for that domain, you can do them all on one if that's what you want. And if you just need one, you can use that one. So they both work the same. And if, I don't know if they're already doing it, but if not already, we can actually also trivially share the same varnish catch object even. Um, we currently already do that with project domain slash static. They're actually all cached as one object in varnish. It just ignores the domain part. And so it allows some kind of rewriting and cache reuse even at the varnish level. Uh, even though they're presented on different domains entirely. Yeah, if it's uniform, then it can be one rule, basically. Yeah, yeah right now the policy with rest.wikimedia.org is really does, we discourage using it because um, we want to encourage people to use the same connections. Um, but it is still available. So if we think this is, I mean, this is only one API, so we want, probably want to have a wider integration for the discoverability part. Um, but yeah, maybe revisit it then. Well, the, the connection reuse goes both ways, right? So if you're using English Wikipedia already, your reuse connection will be contextual things Wikipedia. But if you're consuming 100 different wikis, then your reuse connection is actually going the other way. In that case, you probably want to use REST base as your one domain. Uh, Hi, have you, do you have use cases in mind? <laughs> Uh, yeah, so ac actually, uh, uh, actually, I, I do. So um, from the Contravandalism uh, project, uh, we, we fetch different, it's basically a service that runs in two labs right now, or in Wikimedia Labs, I should say. It's, a, it's its own uh, cluster right now. But um, it makes API requests to many different um, uh, wikis based on whatever recent changes happen across the whole RC feed uh, uh, input from basically all public wikis. And so, it doesn't do it right now because it uses the API to PHP still. But like, if I migrated to RESTBase, I, I can see myself using RESTBase. We committed to reconsider and reuse that connection throughout the whole process. Interesting. So I think in that other questions raised there, I think I've got a summary of the things that we discussed. And if the, and and so there's like the long detailed minutes, and then there's just the brief summary. Like if you needed to write a trip report for this or something, like this would be the piece that you could cut out and say this is what we talked about. Did I get it right? Like is there something? And I guess maybe just as a follow-up, like this is, I this will probably be the the headline for this is what we talked about in this meeting. So um, I think that we can, as, as far as this this summary part. And so um, to the extent that then we can um, follow up on, you know, our, which of these questions is really truly important for us to answer. Um, and which of these questions is like shrug, like we don't care so much. Like I think that that may be, you know, what we should be considering for the coming weeks and months. Yeah, I think the, the discovery part definitely is a very central one that was brought up many times in different, and it's very interesting to change the perspective to look at it from somebody who doesn't know anything about the Wikimedia universe. That I think is a very important point that I took away. Well, we don't want to stand between all of you and lunch. So. <laughs> all right, thank yeah. you. Thanks. <laughs>